Kurt, thank you very much. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Nicholas Budimir. I spoke here earlier uh, in the semester. I want to thank Kurt and George for either inviting me or allowing me back um, to sort of to jump or to leap from one happy topic to another happy topic. I feel a little, um, I wouldn't say underprepared, but just not the right person to be the one to talk about such a heavy and momentous issue as Nazi ideology and the Holocaust. So that is my point to come and talk to you here today. Um, uh, certainly you could find hundreds if not thousands of people more, um, more deserving of the task of being basically the standard bearer of the Shoah or the Nazi Holocaust and, and the one to talk about it to you. I know that many of you have probably experienced uh, lectures on this, uh, movies, documentaries, I'm sure many of you have seen Europa Europa, or Schindler's List, or The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which was a recent, um, recent movie on this. Also, I speak this week because this, this week is uh, the observance of Holocaust Remembrance Days uh, in the United States starting yesterday and running through the 14th. So actually we, it is very apt that we're speaking about this today since all over the country we will hear uh, there will be speeches, lectures, uh, survivors will be speaking in various uh, capacities. But here uh, today I'm trying to talk to you about uh, two major issues. I'm going to try to combine a background on Nazi ideology, the destructive, sometimes irrational, sometimes dynamic uh, ideology of Nazism, its origin in different types of German culture and different types of German thought, and then connect that to how it was possible for the most advanced, the most culturally developed civilization in Europe to descend to become the most deprived, debauched, and destructive civilization in a period of a few years. A few theses and questions that I want to talk about to you. What is Nazi ideology? What intellectual currents in pre-war Germany contributed to Nazi ideology? Why was racism and anti-Semitism so powerful and prevalent in this ideology? How did the Nazi practice in the Nazi state turn genocidal? How was the Holocaust planned and how was the Holocaust carried out? I'll try to touch on all of these issues uh, for you. Uh, I want to start with, uh, going to take you back before the First World War uh, to development of something called the Volkisch Ideologie, Ide Volkisch Ideologie or Volkisch, Volkisch Ideology. Uh, we can use, this substitutes for the term populist, or this was the popular people's ideology, and I'm drawing from the work of George Mossy uh, in his book, The Crisis of German Ideology. And parts of this Volkisch ideology was this, first this discovery of ancient Germans that was uh, happening in the 19th century. 19th century thinkers were discovering new relatives, they were discovering uh, new ancestors for, for the uh, Germans, for the French and the Italians, they were rediscovering their roots and connecting the current peoples that resided in these lands to ancient forebearers. So the, the, already we have the idea of the land and the people, die Land und die Volk, is connected to each other inextric inextricably. So also linguistic races, and this was a, a current all throughout the 18th and 19th century, to rediscover the ancient roots of Italy, of Serbia, of Russia, uh, uh, and many times 
uh, these uh, d rediscovery of the roots were not necessarily the most scientific rediscovery. Sometimes they were imagined rediscovery of ancient roots. Uh, also in the late 19th century, we had the development of very romantic ideas about nations, about races, about nationalisms. The notion of essence, the notion that races were pure races and that expressed an essential national character, Volkscharakter of the nation. Uh, also these ideas of rootedness, connection to the soil, but also Hitler and the uh, early Nazis, but even before, the Volkish thinkers were thinking about destiny, about providence, but also about spirituality, eros, sexual energy, land and power, die Macht. So many irrational forces, forces really deeply uh, inserted in the spirit, the Geist, um, Emotional forces, are looking for an emotional rebirth. This is a romantic energy uh, of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Volkish thinkers were against these external values. Reason, rationality were, were seemingly corrupting European civilization. And the spirit, the Geist, needed to be reawoken. And these ancient roots would somehow uh, 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 ignite the essential spirit, the liquids. You kind of get this idea that the, that the essential energies, the purity of essence, if you go back to Kubrick's movies, uh, would be roused with uh, uh, reawakening the folkish spirit. Also, the folkish ideology truly uh, idealized the peasant. So you see what is the pattern happening here, the land, the peasant, uh, the people connected to the land, and the people's energy was what the folkish thinkers were really all about. And what they were not about was the city, industry, the kind of uh, 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 heavy intellectualizing done in the, in the cafe house. Uh, this was against uh, folkish thought. Uh, and also nature was mystical. There was mystical energy in nature. So it was truly a rejection of the urbanizing tendencies of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And what a lot of the later folkish thinkers did was they connected the disruptions that were being caused by capitalism, the urbanization, the destruction of the small peasant communities, and the reformulation into cities. What folkish thinkers were uh, reformulating this into was antagonism towards Jews. It wasn't capitalism which was causing this, but the infiltration of the eternal Jew was, in, was infiltrating into the spirit and undermining the traditional solidarity of uh, the German people. So displacing frustrations about capitalism, workers' frustrations about uh, losing uh, control over their own production was displaced, not on capitalists, not on Krupp and Thyssen and E.J. Farben, but onto Jews instead. So it was a displacement of aggression from capitalists to Jews in the Volkish thought. So there is this one, so you might uh, uh, try to think of several lines of intellectual thought beginning in uh, Volkish ideology. And here, this is, this is a Nazi-era painting, but it kind of communicates what I want to say about uh, Volkisch thought. Where is it located? It's located in the countryside. Beautiful Aryan peasant girls expressing their energy, not in cities, not in cafe houses, not in a cabaret, uh, not talking to uh, philosophers who are most likely Jewish, but uh, very light-skinned, Aryan peasant stock. And this is the, the uh, 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 purest expression of sort of this Volkish ideology and pure German, not adulterated by external uh, forces. Also in the mid-19th century there, in Germany there was this construction and this glorification of the Teutonic past. 
Uh, this was the Valhalla Memorial in Regensburg. So uh, Germany was, even though Germany was very modern in the 19th century, it was really trying to reconstruct a uh, mythical past. So uh, mythical Valhalla, they were actually constructing Valhalla uh, in Regensburg in uh, uh, 1842. Uh, so you can see sort of they're trying to reconnect themselves also, this is the uh, neoclassical period, they're trying to reconnect themselves to classical Greece, classical Rome, and connect the uh, contemporary 19th century Germany to the past. So this, they were past looking. The Volkisch thought was past looking, not forward, not future looking. All over Europe during this time, uh, there was the development of scientific racism. In Britain, this was nothing special to Germany. In Great Britain, in France, Gobineau, uh, the developer of um, sort of scientific theories of racism in France. Um, so most of 19th century Western Europe, uh, including Germany, was subject to sort of this racial ideology. This picture sort of, uh, sort of shows you the, the noble uh, uh, the noble Teutonic, Nordic, or Aryan race, the Negro race, and the, its supposed purported, but of course false similarity to either a orangutan or baboon. Um, so this so-called scientific or pseudo-scientific processes were really common all over Europe. This fake measuring of skulls, which we have now proven is uh, completely baseless in scientific fact, which is why we call it a pseudoscience, but these, uh, uh, this scientific racism of the period truly thought that races were uh, examples of pure elements, pure essences, and that an adulteration of these essences would be a, uh, in the social, in the Darwinistic theory, uh, would be an adulteration or a destruction of the competitive edge that that race had. So races were conceived of as pure and essential and locked in conflict. And this is something that uh, truly Adolf would uh, pick up on. And this three essential races, Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid was, was sort of the, the racial theory of the day. And these uh, races were already marked, already ranked in European ideology. Uh, from top to bottom, from civilized races of Europe, the barbarous races of Asia, and the savage races of Africa. So that's another um, line of thought. So we have Volkisch thought, we have racial ideology all throughout Europe, but particularly for, uh, combining it with Volkisch thought. But now, what's happening with politics and class in uh, Nazi Germany? This is a wonderful picture of young girls uh, uh, waving the flag. This is after the takeover. But what is the class character? Basically, what is the electoral support for the Nazi party?